Welcome to Soul of Islam Radio. Soul of Islam Radio is a leading edge personal growth and spiritual development podcast available entirely for free throughout the world. Our goal is to support you in your path of personal transformation and spiritual evolution and to supporting an awakening within the global community. The Islamic Renaissance depends upon you and your commitment to the highest and most noble ideals of a spiritually awakened life. Thank you for joining us. This is Ihsan and this is Season 4, Episode 4. Assalamu alaikum. This is Ihsan. I am a personal growth and spiritual development coach, creator of the Islamic Meditation and Eternal Warrior Way programs, lead activist and director in the Islamic Renaissance Project, and co-founder of Solo Islam Radio. In this episode of Solo Islam Radio, I interview Farhad Ameli, director of Two Shine Again Treatment Center in California. Farhad Ameli has been involved in the field of addiction recovery for over 20 years, and is a professional interventionist who supports a holistic approach to healing and recovery. As you will learn in this episode, addiction and abuse is not only limited to the obvious substances such as alcohol, drugs, tobacco, and food, but also includes compulsive behavior such as gambling, compulsive shopping, addiction to video games and pornography, and even addiction to highly negative thought patterns such as anger, fear, jealousy, and chronic anxiety and worry. Although rarely spoken about, addiction and abuse affects the Muslim community like any other community. And in this episode of Soul of Islam Radio, we'd like to shine light on this subject and encourage individuals and families to become aware of the many forms of addictive and abusive behavior and to begin seeking support in recovery and in healing. Islam is a path of personal healing, and through spiritually based solutions, Allah Almighty guides us to becoming the best versions of ourselves truly following in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad sallam and his companions. Beloved listeners of Soul of Islam Radio, I hope you enjoy and benefit from this illuminating interview. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Soul of Islam Radio podcast, Brother Farhad. It's a joy and a pleasure to have you here with us. And inshallah ta'ala, we're looking forward to this episode, which will provide... God willing, immense value to people in our community. Welcome, Brother Farhad. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Let's begin, inshallah ta'ala, with just a little bit of background about yourself, Farhad, in terms of the topic of addiction. We know that in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ continually encourage us to free ourselves from all of those things that bind us and condemn us to the addictions of the lower self, of the nafs. Could you just begin by giving us a little bit of background about yourself and how you came to help people in this field of substance abuse? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, Prophet wasallam warned us about addiction. So that's very clear that addiction has been around forever. And... Uh, that's why we get warnings 1500 years ago and before that. And addiction has been around since plant has been around. And actually some believe that there's more addiction in animals than human beings. Because animals just roam around and just chew on plants. And they can get high and they can become addicted. And you can always see some uh, YouTube videos of animals who just chewed on some plants that got them high and they're totally in, uh, intoxicated. So it's a, a natural phenomenon that does happen. And, uh, and unfortunately, Muslim community is not an exception to it. And actually, in the United States, addiction and many other Western countries, addiction has been identified as a disease. So it's a medical disease, and the disease is in the brain. Part of the brain that gets affected 
or part of the brain that not everybody seems to sh shares the same uh, uh, setup. And in particular is the uh, a part of brain that's called the pleasure center. Some people are more susceptible than others. So due to not their own fault, those who are susceptible to addictions, they seem to get a little bit easier to move and, and, and become addicted, move towards addictive behaviors or substances and become addicted to it. As you mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is attempting to warn us of the dangers of addiction, addictive behavior. And in the course of this episode, we're actually going to speak about addiction on many levels. There's addiction when it comes to substance abuse, such as drugs and alcohol. There are behavioral addictions. And there are other forms of addiction even that we may not necessarily consider addictive behavior. For example, addiction to food or addiction to negativity or addiction to anger. These are all forms of addiction. And inshallah, we'll touch on these in this episode and provide some insights, some solutions, God willing, to help identify these addictive behaviors in ourselves and to be able to take proactive steps towards healing and improving and growing as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to. But first, before we proceed, Brother Farhad, how is it that you found yourself in this field? Now, you run a treatment center, to Shine Again Treatment Center, and you've helped uh, over the last couple of decades, perhaps hundreds of people recover from addiction. How is it that you found yourself in this field, and why are you so passionate about it? Well, my, uh, in my younger age, like any other uh, teen or early 20s, a youth who uh, wants to explore things, I did. I did test, you know, some, some drugs and, and alcohol, and it did not set well with me. And it was changing the course of my life. So at a younger age, I decided that, that I don't want to follow that path because I have seen what happens to people who follow the path of substance or behavioral addiction. And uh, I will explain more in detail, you know, what the substance do and, and, and the behavioral addiction does. And uh, so my own... Uh, decision that I made to stop everything altogether helped me to made it easier for me actually to help other people stop it so we can develop a community we can have a community of people who uh, at some point perhaps pro had problem with it and now they are supporting one another and uh, so that was just the base of my uh, my decision to uh, work in treatment. Then I went to college and I graduated with a degree in psychology and management. So I did manage several uh, treatment centers in my career. I've been doing this more than 30 years. And, uh, and now I have my own uh, treatment center in Southern California. So that was the beginning of my uh, decision to go into this field. You mentioned about community and Allah Azawajal in the Quran commands us to keep the company of the truthful, to keep the company of the pious, the humble, the believers. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always encouraged to keep the company of those who have qualities and traits that we would like to aspire to. How important is it in the life of a human being to keep the company of others in their path of personal development and in their healing. Because I, and I ask this because here in the West, we have almost forgotten the importance and the power of community, of brotherhood, of association. In Arabic, what is sometimes referred to as suhbah, companionship. And we're taught to do things essentially on our own. And we really find ourselves often struggling 
with addictions or addictive behaviors. We may sometimes chalk it up to a lack of discipline, a lack of willpower. But oftentimes, it seems that when one really looks at it, what may be lacking is companionship towards a goal on a path. So how important do you and in your practice have you seen it to be that one needs companionship, support, and to be part of a community on their path of development as well as on their path of healing? Well, in all areas of our lives, we need companionship of others. In any aspect of our life that we want to develop, we need to have companions. There is a uh, metaphor we use in, uh, in treatment community. We talk about a picture in the frame. There is a picture of someone in the frame. That person cannot see himself or herself because they are in the frame. But others can see them. So community's responsibility or community's role in companionship is to be a mirror to us to see us and tell us who we are and uh, and how there are some blind sides in our life that we cannot see but it's obvious to others so in that respect community is is one of the uh, essential part of uh, treatment and recovery when it comes to addictions it has the biggest role of anything the community and the group that's uh, helping, it will be like the heart of treatment. People is the heart of treatment and, uh, and moving towards total recovery. I constantly remember the words of, of our teacher, our sheikh, who always used to say that the way is in companionship and that there is always goodness in gathering with others, especially towards a noble goal. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu said that any gathering in which the remembrance of Allah is absent is a dead gathering. I just want to emphasize this point that in our path, we must seek companionship. In our healing, we must seek companionship and community. Because without that, it is almost impossible. We must leverage the support and the energy of others. And again, why in Islam... We are constantly encouraged to worship and to commune in congregation. When we think of addictive behavior or addictions, we often think of substance abuse. And that is perhaps the most obvious forms of addiction. Addiction to drugs, to alcohol. There are other forms of addiction, behavioral addictions. Could you speak a little bit about addiction in general and what you've experienced in your professional and in your personal life with regards to human behavior? Well, a good description of addiction in general is that some substance or some action outside of yourself is going to make you feel different. And uh, for instance, if you have a headache and you take aspirin, that aspirin is a substance outside of yourself. It's going to make your headache go away. Or it's going to numb your headache until naturally the headache will go away. So substance is like that. If you're not feeling good inside and or you want to feel if you're in pain or you want to feel pleasure, you want to have fun, you go towards some people go towards uh, using substance either alcohol or other drugs. By the way, alcohol is one of the oldest drugs. And that's why it was prohibited in, in time of Prophet Sallallahu And that was, you know, he, among a lot of leadership skills he had, one of them was counseling. So we owe this uh, trade, this profession to him because that's what we do. We counsel people who have difficulty with alcohol and drugs. So he counseled many of his Sahabas. They were drinkers. Some of his family members, some of his tribe members, they were drinkers. So it's not abnormal that people gravitate towards alleviating some of the pain, whether it's psychological pain, emotional pain, or physical pain with some substance. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
because of the brain composition, some people are more susceptible to become an addict. Some people will uh, be able to take it or leave it. But others, once they take it, they don't know how to leave it. They don't have that control. They lose the control. So that's how the addiction comes about. And especially these days, with all the pharmaceutical medication in the market, all the painkillers, as soon as you have any kind of pain, you go to a doctor, they quickly write your prescription. And that's why there is this huge disaster in the United States and, and many other countries. People are addicted on, on painkillers. So addiction is uh, usually my experience in, in this profession has been when I interview people and on their intake, why they're using substance or why they're drinking, they say, well, I just had too much pain. I want to get rid of it. Or I wanted to have fun. And I was young. I didn't know. I just wanted to have fun. I never wanted to become addicted. But just one thing led to another. And I always thought that I could stop whenever I want to. And when I could stop, I didn't want to. And when I wanted to stop, then I couldn't. So it gets to that position. It passes an invisible line that you become an addict and you don't have control over it anymore. And it's not your fault. It's a disease. And uh, as I mentioned, I haven't interviewed any client, probably thousands of clients I have interviewed. Nobody said, I used uh, marijuana or you know the gateway drugs or I drink some beer because I want to become an alcoholic or want to become an addict. Nobody has said that yet. So it starts innocently and either to have pleasure or avoid pain. And then it graduates and it's a progressive disease. It's a progressive illness. So that's as far as substance, which could include any kind of opiates, marijuana, any kind of uh, uppers, downers, any medication. There are some, uh, uh, you know, closet addicts, like housewife who's uh, addicted on uh, on substance, on uh, prescription drugs. And they say, oh, because the doctor gives me, it's okay for me to take this. I need to take this Xanax. I need to take this Valium. I need to take this because doctor gave it to me. But they are addicted and their life is miserable. So there are many levels of addiction. It's not, addiction is not always the person on the street, the criminal uh, element of the, although, you know, Anybody who uses drugs is acting criminally because use of drug is not legal. Most drugs are not legal. So substance addiction is very vast. And it's uh, hitting all the communities. And Muslim community is not exception. Our youth are associating with other people in this society, and they're becoming addicted. We don't hear enough, in my opinion, about these real type of problems that people within our community are struggling with. Often when we go to the masjid or to a gathering or to a talk or a class or a seminar or a session, very often the discussion is really aimed at those who may not necessarily be suffering from sort of these common problems. It may perhaps generally be aimed at people who are interested you know, in their religion and in their deen and at some level are already somehow safe from some of these problems. But nevertheless, this is a huge problem within the Muslim community, just like any other community. In your experience, how significant of a problem is this in the Muslim community and how prevalent is substance abuse and addiction among the Muslims in the world today? If you are able to rephrase the question. How common, how common is heart attack or heart problem or high blood pressure or diabetes in Muslim community? Would that be different than other communities? I don't think so. And addiction is the same. Maybe it's more hidden because we look at any kind of addiction as 
it was a choice. The person who has heart problem or heart blood pressure or diabetes didn't choose to have that. But the addict chose to take the drug. Yes, addict chose to take the drug, but he didn't choose to become addict. They took the drug and thinking, no, this will never affect me as it did other people. I would never become addicted to this. So I don't think our community is any different than any other community because addiction is a disease and diseases don't discriminate. They affect everybody the same. And they don't discriminate on any level, on a socioeconomical level, on gender, age, they don't. I had uh, clients of all different backgrounds, Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Jews, non-believer. They all started with the same, same thing. And the commonality is, is the innocent belief that it's not going to affect me the way it would affect other people. But it's a taboo subject, and nobody wants to admit to that. Nobody wants to admit, nobody wants to even believe for themselves, despite of the evidence that their loved ones are addicted to drugs or alcohol, or they have any problem with it. Individuals don't want to, because it's a subject of shame and guilt. How could a good Muslim family admit that their son or daughter is addicted to drugs? Or they are addicted to other behavioral uh, addiction. I will explain behavioral addiction a little bit too. Because behavioral addiction affects a person the same way as a substance do. Substance affects your, uh, your brain to release some in- endorphins. So you feel good. Endorphins are God-given hormones that everyone has it that gets released in their body. And the natural uh, way of getting uh, feeling good is if you have a good food, you're going to feel good after it, especially in the month of Ramadan. You know, uh, the hadith says, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, said that you will have two rewards for your, uh, for your fasting, one when you break your fast and one time when you meet your Lord. So what's the reward that we get when we break our fast? We feel good. We all become happy and, and start laughing and, and being happy and, and elated. So that's a natural endorphin. Now what happens with drugs, it gives you an endorphin five times as much, ten times as much, depending on the drugs. So when you continuously do that, it just kills your natural ability to enjoy regular things in life. The simple things of you know loving your family, loving your wife or loving your parents or having a good meal or going on a good hike. You know, even uh, exercise releases the same endorphin. Now we come to uh, behavioral addiction. They do release the same endorphin. For instance, a gambler is never gambling to win money. It's not gambling. It's not about money. It's about feeling good. It's about getting that high from winning something and also it has its low when you lose everything or uh, you know compulsive shopping god knows how many people are caught in this consumerism society that they are buying things they don't even need they're just buying it to have to feel good they're not buying it because of what that materialistic thing is you know what's the what's the difference between a a very high-end car and a and a, and a regular car. The high-end car has more class, and you're going to feel good, and you're gonna, it's going to boost your ego, and you're going to feel, yeah, I, I feel good about this, having a Mercedes, or, you know, nothing wrong with that. I'm, not, I'm just using that as an example. If you have a Mercedes, I don't want you to feel bad about it. But a Mercedes or a Honda will get you from point A to point B. So... And if you're just buying it because it's a vehicle and there's no attachment to it, it's fine. But if there's too much attachment to it, that's the problem. And that, that becomes the compulsive behavior. And you have more than 
few clothes that you need to wear, then that's behavioral problem. You have compulsive shopping uh, uh, behavior. And if you're eating more than uh, you're supposed to, then you're a compulsive eater. And that goes for everything. It goes for sexual activities. It goes for uh, eating and sleeping and anger and you name it. There are, the list is like endless. You've made uh, several really important points. One being that addiction and addictive behavior really is a disease. It's not something that we, one should really guilt and shame someone about, but rather recognize as an actual disease that needs to be treated. You've also pointed out how behaviors can result in similar highs and activate the same pleasure centers in the brain to release hormones that make us feel good. And that addiction is not just limited to alcohol or drugs, but can also include shopping or gambling, pornography, video games, food. These are all forms of addiction. And we as Muslims are continually encouraged to liberate ourselves from this lower level desires that condemn us to lower states of consciousness. It may be particularly challenging in the modern world in which we are continually encouraged and bombarded with images and marketing to lead us into addictive behaviors and in which temporal pleasure is so readily accessible. I mean, you have to just drive down the road, pop through a drive through and get the most you know, unhealthy but addictive food literally within minutes. Everything is so easily accessible. How important in your practice have you come to realize the role of spirituality and surrendering to a higher power, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the process of recovery and healing? How vital is spirituality in healing from addiction and recovering from addictive behavior? As human beings, we are multidimensional. We are not only physical or mental or spiritual. So, and addiction does affect all areas. And addiction is not only physical, it's not only mental, and it's not only spiritual, it's all of the above. So we have to address all these for a whole human being. And we cannot just disregard one part and treat only one part. Yeah, physically, we can treat the person to overcome from their physical substance addiction. Detoxification is that part. But if we don't attend to the person's mental status and their spiritual status, if we don't attend to all aspects of the person, and if uh, we attend only to the physical portion of it, detoxifying them, what's going to happen is this person is going to return to their drugs or alcohol or addictive behavior. And majority of the people who come to treatment with substance addiction, they have other behavioral addiction as well. Now, you take away that primary, which could be any of the uh, drugs that we mentioned or some we haven't mentioned. If it's a particular substance, you take away the primary, then the secondary behavioral addiction becomes primary. For instance, people who stop using drugs, they start eating food. And there's a term uh, used in, uh, mostly in uh, opiate users, is say, uh, you put down the spoon, pick up the fork. Because there is a hole, there is a, gap in your body, in your soul, that you think if you eat, it's going to fill up that hole. So, and uh, naturally you will see a lot of people in the early stage of their treatment, they gain weight. And uh, what we do attend to that. We make them, make the, our clients, our patients to be aware of what they are doing. And in eating, we help them by meditating on their food. Where did this food come from? Who grow this food? And how many people did it take for this food to get to my table? 
to my plate. And uh, by thinking about that, they're going to probably a little bit more get their mental and spiritual being in that eating session too. So we are treating people as a whole person. And as far as spiritual beliefs, we, uh, we call, the, call Allah Almighty in, uh, in treatment, we call it higher power. He's the power that's above all. And it's higher than any of us. And uh, to keep it open for all believers. So we don't want to just close it only for those who believe in Allah. Many people believe in Allah. Jews believe in Allah. Christians believe in Allah. Muslim believes in Allah. If your first tongue is Arabic. But when it comes to speaking English... English speakers don't think Allah is the God of Jews and Christians because in English it's called something else. They think Allah is only Muslims God. So we we try not to discriminate on that and uh, and make it universal. And what is more important to have a name or have the essence of that higher power to be attached to. And that's what we concentrate on to get to the essence of that higher power. You mentioned the importance of a holistic approach in healing and in recovery. What are some of the modalities that you incorporate in your practice, some of the practices that you incorporate, some of the healing therapies and techniques that you include in your practice for those seeking a holistic approach to healing and to wellness? Well, some of the practices, as far as for physical, we detoxify the person from the substance and also we keep them from the behavioral addiction. And as far as physical goes again, a proper diet is very important. A wholesome diet that will nourish their body. Many people who are uh, using drugs or drinking, they're getting their calories in a, in a wrong places, in a wrong diet. So we have good food and then uh, again, for the physical, these are all on the physical level. Exercise will uh, will help them with exercise. We'll go on walks, nothing uh, very uh, difficult, especially for the early stages. You go on long walks. We are on a beautiful property in uh, Southern California. A lot of rolling hills and uh, trails to walk around. We go on walks daily. And, uh, and then when we get to mental and spiritual aspect of that, of a holistic approach, we do have meditation, we have mental exercises, uh, journaling, writing uh, exercises, and, uh, and, and other uh, uh, help for, uh, let's say, uh, yoga. And, uh, you know, maybe not everybody wants to do the same thing. So we have something for everybody. And we have many things that will uh, accommodate uh, most of our uh, clients, most of our patients. Earlier you mentioned that often the topic of addiction is something that is often suppressed. It's denied. What are some signs that a human being can see in themselves and in their behavior that would let them know that they are actually operating out of an addiction? And this may be helpful, not just for those who are indulging in some sort of substance abuse, but even some of the other forms of addiction that we mentioned, that you mentioned earlier. Well, if uh, anything that's trying to fill that gap inside of you, that's not in a spiritual uh, path or from a spiritual source, and it's on physical or mental source, eating, shopping, using drugs, gambling, you know, those kind of things. If it's like that, and you're doing that, and, and you're, uh, as soon as you feel the gap again, and you, need, you feel the need to repeat your behavior, whether it's using or behavioral. If you keep repeating those behavior, and it's not getting any better, and uh, because addiction is progressive, you're going to need more. If, uh, let's say for a compulsive shopper, if you bought 
you know, a pair of shoes and maybe some shirts yesterday, it's not going to make you feel good today. You need to do something else. And if you keep doing that, and then you look at your closet and you have shoes or, uh, or shirts that you haven't even worn, and they're just sitting in your closet, so maybe it's something that you want to look at your, your own behavior. And if it's substance, substances are addictive. Majority of them are addictive, and you cannot live from one day to another without taking them. So that's very obvious. But what I like to really talk about is the family member, your loved ones, those who are around you, your friends, people who care about you. You know, addiction can affect them too. It's a disease not only affects the individual who's the identified client, identified patient, but affects at least three to four other members of that family who are affected because of the individual's addiction. And, and how it affects them is they will be in denial. Let's say a young man <coughs> of uh, 20, early 20s, and the parents keep seeing some signs and symptoms of uh, not being normal for a, young, for a young man. Maybe they're dropping off school, maybe their grades are going down, Maybe they're coming in late, their communication is not that strong with family anymore, and they don't want to be at home, they want to leave, and, and the parents keep denying these signs. These all could be signs of substance abuse. And, uh, and if the parents are denying this because they feel bad, they say, no, not, not my son, usually the parents would think, no, it, it wouldn't happen to my son. And it wouldn't happen to my daughter, especially daughter. In the Muslim community, a girl, no way. You're not going to believe that. You're not going to admit to yourself either. Because there's guilt and shame. And a lot of times parents feel like, you know, what did I do? I wish I could share with you how many parents have told me this. When they bring their son or daughter to me, whether it be Muslim or non-Muslim, they say, I don't know what I did wrong for my son or daughter to go like this. To become this. And I assure you, you didn't do anything wrong. As a parent, you're doing your best. But if you're denying it and not seeking treatment, then maybe you need to think about that. Because if your son or daughter had difficulties, physical ailment, like they were diabetic, you wouldn't I say, oh, I did something wrong. Maybe you say it, but you will quickly seek treatment for them. You will not deny it. You will not delay it. You will not deny it over and over and not uh, seek treatment for your, uh, for your loved ones. So as soon as you see some signs, contact some professional. Contact professional people who are in this field and they are in this profession and they know all the signs and symptoms. And, and bring them for an interview. Interview with a professional counselor, with a professional uh, psychologist who can determine whether your son is uh, or daughter is addicted or not. So that's really important. And in fact, that was going to be my very next question, which would have been, or which is, what is the single most important step that a human being can take when recognizing that they either themselves are suffering from addiction or someone they love? Well, an assessment by a professional will determine that. Because if you have some signs and sy symptoms of other physical ailment, you go and you have some tests. You run some blood tests, some urine tests, some EKGs, and you know various tests to find out what's wrong for them to have a proper diagnosis. Same thing will, uh, will be true with addiction. Maybe some tests, blood tests or urine tests, will show if there's any drugs in the system and psychological test. And there are some questionnaires. And a lot of times, individual who's using it, maybe they would deny it to their parents or to their loved one, but to a professional, they would not deny it. They'll be more open to it because it's a mutual person. It's a person who wants to help them. Maybe your uh, loved one will be ashamed or feel guilty to admit to you. 
So it's natural for them to deny as a parents or a wife or husband or brother, sister. You know, your role should be just that, either parent or brother or sister. Just have love for your uh, family, but take them to a professional person to determine if this person needs help. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. I want to thank you, Brother Farhad, for joining us on Soul of Islam Radio and also for your service to the community, both to the Muslim community and the greater community at large. May Allah put more barakah in your work and may He subhanahu wa ta'ala increase awareness and knowledge and the resources that we need within the Muslim community and as human beings in general to live lives increasingly in alignment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will for us. Thank you for joining us, Brother Farhad. In my gratitude, I thank you for allowing me to be here and be of service to our community. I wish the best for all those who are in the grips of addiction and those who are the extended family. And there is hope. I know there is hope because I know thousands of people who probably were in the same place as you are, or some of them maybe even in worse places. Now their lives has changed. And addiction is known as being a family disease. And what that means is one person is addicted to some, something or behavior, the rest of the family is suffering. And if that person gets clean, the rest of the family will get the same help, will have the same effect, and they'll have the same recovery in, uh, in their life. And the whole uh, community will glow. Thank you for having me here. Jazakallah khairun. And for all of our listeners on Soul of Islam Radio, you can learn more about Farhad Amali and his work at his website, toshineagain.com. And that is spelled the number two, shineagain.com. We will have a link in the show notes as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and protect all of you, your families, your loved ones, our community, and guide and raise us all as a nation and as an ummah aspiring to health, to wellness, to healing, and to success, both in this life and the next. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Soul of Islam Radio. It is our goal to educate and inspire, and to help you continually develop your path and practice within the noble way of Al-Islam. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And more importantly, that you benefited and have gained something with which you can continue to advance in your religion. Here's what to do next. Visit us at www.soulofislamradio.com where you can get access to exclusive resources to help you deepen your knowledge and understanding of Islam. At soulofislamradio.com, you can learn how to cultivate a real, relevant, and practical spiritual path. Also, if you have not yet done so, please subscribe to this podcast via iTunes and leave us a review. This will help others find Soul of Islam Radio. And the few minutes you take to leave positive feedback could make the difference in someone else's life. Lastly, please share this resource with family and friends. You just might save someone's life. And there's nothing greater than to be the means through which a human being begins to discover the divine presence of God. Again, thank you for joining us and for committing to your own personal growth and spiritual awakening. Together, we can change our world, serve our Lord and Creator, and attain to His divine pleasure. This is Ihsan, wishing you joy, success, happiness, and prosperity in both this life and the next, to your divine, eternal, and absolute success. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Love.